Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, uh, Michael Cloggs. And today we're going to hear from the Secretary General of the United Nations. And, and also we're going to hear from President uh, Zelensky of Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the um, translator to, to work properly so that we could translate uh, exactly what President Zelensky had to say, but <clears throat> Antonio Guerreras is fortunately uh, clearly in English as he makes comments to the press conference in Kiev. Um, he, in his opening, he did thank President Zelensky for a more welcome in most difficult times. And he says, I witnessed very vividly today around Kiev the senseless loss of life and the massive destruction and the unacceptable violations of human rights and laws of war. It is vital that the International Criminal Court and other UN mechanisms conduct work so that there can be real accountability. The position of the United Nations is clear. As he had said in Moscow, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine is a violation of territorial integrity and the Charter of the United Nations. And he was there to focus on how the UN can expand support the people of Ukraine, saving lives, reduce suffering, and find a peace path for both countries to continue. I want you, uh, the Ukrainian people, to know what the world sees you, hears you, and is in all of your resi resilience and resolve. So, um, we also will hear from the International Court Process prosecutor on you on Ukraine and prosecutor Krim Assad Ahmed Khan he is going to make statements about other evidence gathering and working with the Ukrainian government and their prosecutors to bring justice to the people and to find those who need to be held accountable for war crimes, and offenses. So, why don't we listen to today's segment and open our hearts to the people of Ukraine and also to the general pe people of Russia who are being fed propaganda and rhetoric and may not necessarily know how the rest of the world is viewing this unprecedented attack on the Ukraine. Сутні, шановні журналісти. Візит в Україну генерального секретаря ООН пана Антоніо Гутериша важливий і не тільки для нас. Саме в Україні сьогодні захищаються принципи статуту ООН. 
Я вдячний пану Гутеришу за його чітку і однозначну позицію щодо розв'язаної Росією війни проти України. Ми цінуємо ваші спроби задіяти механізми добрих послуг для деескалації ситуації. Потрібно використовувати кожен шанс, щоб досягти миру. Важливо, що сьогодні генеральний секретар особисто пересвідчився у воєнних злочинах Росії в Україні, відвідавши передмістя Києва. Я вдячен вам за це. Коли бачиш на власні очі, що зробили окупанти Російської Федерації проти наших мирних людей, то переконуєшся, що це справжній геноцид. А також сприяти у створенні спеціального міжнародного трибуналу щодо злочинів в Росії. Цю тематику ми також піднімали з паном Гутерешем. Моніторингова місія ООН з прав людини зі свого боку має продовжувати документувати усі злочини Російської Федерації, російських військових. Правда полягає в тому, що російське вторгнення принесло на українську землю стільки злочинів проти мирних людей, проти мирних міст, скільки Європа не бачила з часів Другої світової війни. І дуже важливо, що пан Гутериш у Москві порушив питання евакуації наших людей з міста Маріуполя, зокрема і з заводу Азовсталь. Ми бачимо, що попри слова президента Росії про нібито припинення військових дій в Маріуполі, територія заводу Азовсталь зазначає варварських бомбардувань від російської армії. Ці бомбардування тривали навіть під час переговорів пана генсекретаря у Москві. Україна готова до невідкладних переговорів для евакуації людей з Азовсталі та до миттєвого втілення досягнутих домовленостей. Очікуємо також ставлення людського до цих людей від Російської Федерації. Розраховуємо, що ця частина місії пана генерального секретаря буде результативною, готові усіляка цьому сприяти. Закликав пана генерального секретаря докласти зусиль для того, щоб зупинити депортацію громадян України в Росію. Росія незаконно і примусово переміщує дорослих та дітей, вже сотні тисяч українців, фактично вкрадені. Управління Верховного комісара ООН у справах біженців і Міжнародна організація з міграції – це дуже важливі інструменти і завдання для них зараз, на нашу думку, отримати доступ до наших громадян, яких депортували в Російську Федерацію, і забезпечити їхнє повернення додому в Україну якнайшвидше. Ми детально обговорили сьогодні, я отримав запевнення щодо підтримки шляхом готівкових виплат на громадян та щодо збільшення обсягів гуманітарної допомоги України та важливість залучення ООН до післявоєнної відбудови нашої держави. Говорили сьогодні також і про важливий не лише для України, але й для усього світу виклик продовольчу кризу, яку провокує Росія продовженням війни проти нашої держави. Україна буквально дає хліб для майже 400 мільйонів людей на планеті. І вже зараз ООН визнає, що зростання цін на продовольство цьогоріч спричинить голод для мінімуму 47 мільйонів людей у 81 країні світу. Ми маємо до Достатній потенціал, щоб не допустити такої продовольчої кризи і стабілізувати глобальний ринок. Маємо всі товари, які ми можемо постачати з наших портів в Одесі, Миколаєві, Херсонській і Запорізькій областях. Але частиною агресивної політики Росії, агресивної війни Росії проти нашої держави є саме блокада наших українських портів. А також свідомі для російської, для російської армії руйнації нашої виробничої бази, їх кроки в цьому напрямку і, зокрема, зокрема, руйнування нашої аграрної бази. Тому припинення цієї війни Росії проти України і повернення миру є обов'язковим, щоб не допустити продовольчу кризу і врятувати десятки країн від голоду та політичного хаосу. Ми обговорили необхідність зробити все можливе для того, щоб Росія розблокувала українські порти для вивезення продовольства. Це питання важливе не лише для України, ще раз це підкреслю. І в першу чергу, я вважаю, для усього світу і для ООН, яка його представляє. Ще раз дякую за візит. Президент Зеленський, thank you very much for your warm welcome in these most difficult times. Today, Ukraine is an epicenter of unbearable heart age and pain. 
I witnessed that very vividly today around Kyiv. The senseless loss of life, the massive destruction, the unacceptable violations of human rights and the laws of war. It is vital that the International Criminal Court and other UN mechanisms conduct their work so that there can be real accountability. The position of the United Nations is clear. As I said in Moscow, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a violation of its territorial integrity and of the Charter of the United Nations. And I'm here to focus on ways on how the UN can expand support for the people of Ukraine, saving lives, reducing suffering, and helping find the path of peace. I want the Ukrainian people to know that the world sees you, hears you, and is in awe of your resilience and resolve. I also know that words of solidarity are not enough. I am here to zero in on needs on the ground and scale up operations. Let me be very clear. The Security Council failed to do everything in its power to prevent and end this war. And this is a source of great disappointment, frustration, and anger. But the men and women of the United Nations are working every day for the people of Ukraine side by side with so many brave Ukrainian organizations. I salute the more than 1,400 staff of the UN, the vast majority of whom are Ukrainian nationals. They are on the ground in nine operational hubs and 30 locations. Many have been here from day one, and we have sent in additional personnel since then to serve the Ukrainian people. They are engaged in an enormously complicated mission under difficult conditions. This is one of the fastest scale-up operations we have ever undertaken, and we are very much aware that not everything is perfect. Whatever we can provide pains in comparison to the needs. And I'm here to pledge that we will boost our efforts across the board, coordinating with the Ukrainian government every step of the way. Until now, we have provided life-saving humanitarian aid to 3.4 million people inside Ukraine, and we are aiming to more than double that number to 8.7 million by the end of August. Some recent estimates show a worst-case scenario in which some 25 million people could be in need of humanitarian assistance by the end of this year. We hope this scenario does not materialize, but we are obliged to plan for it. And we are expanding our cash assistance, distributing 100 million per month, reaching now 1.3 million people by May, and covering 2 million by August. But this will be done in very close coordination with the Ukrainian government. This is not a typical humanitarian UN operation in a country, in a developing country with lots of problems of governance and lots of difficulties. The Ukraine is a country with a government and with a system of support to its citizens. And so the role of the UN is not to replace that government, is to support the government in the government section to support the people of Ukraine. Our food aid has reached 2.3 million people, but we want to help 4 million by May and 6 million by June, and the plans will be implemented. And with more than 12 million Ukrainians who fled their homes, we are supporting host countries that have generously received over 5 million refugees. But more important, we are increasing our capacity to meet the needs of 7.7 .7 million that have been displaced inside the country based on a recent survey by the International Organization of Migration. The World Health Organization is delivering medical supplies for trauma and emergency care for more than 7 million people. And they are also stepping up our vital efforts to extend urgent health care, emergency shelter, water and sanitation, and to protect children and gender-based violence, all in very close contact and very close coordination with the Ukrainian government. And we are also advancing the work of accountability and justice by monitoring and reporting on human rights violations wherever they are detected. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, all this work is essential, but it doesn't address the root cause of all this human suffering, the war itself. This war must end, 
and peace must be established in line with the Charter of the United Nations and international law. Many leaders have made many good efforts to stop the fighting, but these efforts so far have not succeeded. And I am here to say to you, Mr. President, and to the people of Ukraine, we will not give up. As we keep pushing for a full-scale ceasefire, we will also keep striving for immediate practical steps to save lives and reduce human suffering. Effective humanitarian corridors, local cessations of hostilities, safe passage for civilian and supply routes. Today, the people of Mariupol is in, are in desperate need for just such an approach. Mariupol is a crisis within a crisis. Thousands of civilians need life-saving assistance. Many are elderly in need of medical care or have limited mobility. They need an escape route out of the apocalypse. During my visit to Moscow, President Putin agreed in principle to the involvement of the United Nations and the International Committee for the Red Cross in the evacuation of civilians from the Azvostal plant in Mariupol. Today, President Zelensky and I had the opportunity to address this issue. And as we speak, there are intense discussions to move forward on this proposal to make it a reality. Finally, let me say that in many ways we are at ground zero for the world we need to build. A world of respect for international law, the UN Charter and the power of multilateralism. A world that protects civilians, a world that advances human rights, a world where leaders live up to the values that they have promised to uphold. That too is a struggle. But it is one that we must win for the sake of every country, community, and person around the world. Thank you. Володимир Олександрович, запитання до вас. Ви в суботу дуже так емоційно висловлювалися незадоволення тим, що пан Генсек спочатку поїде до Москви, а потім поїде до України. Після сьогоднішніх ваших розмов, після того, як пан генерал секретар побував в Бучі, Ірпіні, Бородянці, чи ви задоволені власне баченням паном Генсеком війни в Україні? Чи ви змінили своє ставлення? І чи бачите ви якісь ну практичну допомогу від ООН, особливо конкретно, що стосується Маріуполя? And my question to Mr. General Secretary, uh, Young Secretary General, you have, you have been to Moscow just recently and spoke to the biggest war criminal of the 21st century, the head of, a, of the biggest gas station of planet Earth, Mr. Putin. Uh, you've looked into his eyes and now he, he told you obviously something. And now you're here in Ukraine and you've seen what he has done around Kyiv and around Ukraine. Do you see any chance, any practical chances that the world can stop him, especially with his uh, continuous threats to use the nuclear weapons. Thank you. Якщо коротко, я дійсно вважаю, що сьогодні Україна це пріоритет. І вважаю, що ті чи інші лідери, статусні лідери, люди, які вирішують у світі багато важливих речей, особливо щодо захисту прав, свобод, щодо захисту життя людей, повинні бути в Україні. Я так вважаю, це моя особиста думка. Я вдячен генеральному секретарю, що він сьогодні тут. Я вдячен йому за те, що головне питання, про яке ми сьогодні говорили, це порушення прав, свобод в Україні, Російською Федерацією. І найголовніше, що ми можемо зробити, що ООН може зробити для того, щоб дійсно розблокувати Азовсталь, для того, щоб дійсно зберегти життя людям. Ми сьогодні приділили цьому питанню багато часу. І я буду вірити, як і ви, а перш за все, як всі ті близькі люди, тих людей, які там заблоковані, що генеральному секретарю і нам всім вдасться отримати бажаний результат, отримати назад живих людей. I have to say that um, what I said in Moscow what I said here and what I say in New York is exactly the same. Probably you have heard my press conference with the Minister Lavrov. The speech was very similar to this one. You have eventually uh, seen the part that uh, 
the Russian television has given of the conversation between President Putin and myself. And you heard me saying to President Putin the same things I said myself. So it is being coherent with the defense of the values of the UN and the values of the UN Charter. And one of the values of the UN and the UN Charter is that the territorial integrity of countries must be respected. This is fundamental from the point of view of international law. And I hope that, as in everything else in life, law will prevail. Yeah, Mr. President Zelensky, could you please say what are actually the security guarantees you were asking from the Russian Federation for the humanitarian corridor out of Mariupol? And Mr. General Secretary, could you please tell us a little bit more about the general principle that Mr. Putin agreed on when you met him in Moscow a few days ago? And what will the UN do if the Russian Federation is violating these general principles the President agreed on? Thank you very much. Madam, what do you want? Do you want the people to be rescued, or do you want me to say something that will be an obstacle to that rescue? At the present moment, I can only tell you we are doing everything we can to make it happen. I'm not going to enter into any comment that would undermine that possibility, because my first and only priority is the people that suffer and the people that must be rescued. That's Just exactly what you want, is to me to say things that would not facilitate the what we are doing at the present moment, is to guarantee that that happens. I, I cannot admit that it will not happen. If it will not happen, I will take the right decisions at the right moment. And about the time frame, you can say anything about the time frame? Again, no. I am working with only one objective, not to shine in the media. I'm being very boring to the media on purpose, because the only way to ensure the rescue of people is to be boring to the media, because we have enough difficulties by themselves. Головні гарантії безпеки для мене після того, що ми втратили 500 тисяч людей, які були просто вивезені і депортовані на територію Російської Федерації, а згідно навіть <кій> тих чи інших офіційних медіа Російської Федерації, вони сказали, що вже мільйон вони прийняли. Ну, вони кажуть, що вони прийняли мільйон людей, а ми знаємо, що депортували силою 500 тисяч. Так ось головні гарантії для мене на сьогодні, щоб ці люди, скільки б їх не було, щоб вони були живі, і вони не були рабами, а саме обирали, куди їм їхати. І я знаю їх вибір, щоб вони були вивезені на територію, яку контролює Україна. Дякую. Інтерфакс Україна. У мене запитання до пана генерального секретаря. Перше, ви самі сказали сьогодні, що Рада безпеки ООН не виконала ті функції, які, які від неї очікували. Скажіть, будь ласка, яким чином, з вашої точки зору, треба реформувати Організацію Об'єднаних Націй для того, щоб вона була ефективна в вирішенні конфліктів і не повторила в майбутньому шлях Ліги Націй? І запитання до пана президента. Ми говорили на кілька днів тому про можливий псевдореферендум в Херсонській області. Він не відбувся, який мав бути сьогодні. Але з іншого боку з'явилася інформація про підготовку наступного референдуму вже в так званих ДНР ЛНР про приєднання до Росії. Принаймні в Маріуполі деяким дітям вже е, вчителі е, пишуть, що Маріуполь – це Ростовська область. Як ви знаєте, сьогодні ця інформація була. Якою буде ваша реакція? Дякую. And the UN are all the men and women that are working in different parts of the world to support people that are victims of war, that are victims of conflict. I have not the power to reform the Security Council. I have no illusions about the possibility to do it immediately. But I will do everything I can through making the UN as effective as possible in situations like these to at least compensate for a failure that I cannot solve. 
and you can be sure of our total commitment to support the Ukrainian people in this difficulty and to our permanent voice asking for the end of this war and the end of this war in respect for international law and in respect for the Charter of the United Nations. Ну, таких псевдореферендумів ще може бути дуже багато, як теоретичних, на жаль, якщо брати початок цієї війни і брати кримське питання, то і, на жаль, і практичних. <кій> Україна все одно не буде це визнавати, а найголовніше, що разом з Україною у свій, у ць, весь цивілізований світ не буде визнавати таких референдумів. Я вважаю, що силою не можна приєднувати і не вдасться приєднати ту чи іншу нашу територію. Наші люди у це показали, що навіть з танками зможуть впоратись. Я вже не говорю про будь-які вантажів, які там приходять, щось збирають якісь підписи, готують ті чи інші референдуми. Тому я думаю, що це нічого не дасть, окрім того, що я в принципі вже говорив, це ще одна ускладненість ймовірних вже таких Ймовірних хоч якихось перемовин Росії і України на будь-якому вже. Я вже бачите, скільки абстрактно на все це дивлюсь, а хочеться конкретики. Тому мені здається, що це ускладнення будь-яких перемовин. Тим більше, що ви бачите, що є питання гуманітарного характеру щодо розблокування людей. Тим більше, ми бачимо, що є економічні питання щодо продовольчої безпеки. Не тільки нас стосуються, як я сказав, так і всього світу щодо розблокування морських шляхів. Багато питань. Якщо ми хочемо все це ускладнювати, вже для всієї Європи, для всього світу, можна продовжувати гратись в ці референдуми, які ніяко не дадуть результату, не як поточного і не історичного. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for, for waiting. We've just concluded a, an ARIA side event on accountability in Ukraine, uh, hosted by uh, Albania and France, Uh, and with really excellent uh, attendance. Uh, a variety of points were, were made. Uh, of course, many of you would have had access to what was said in the ECOSOC room next door, but the principle that I wanted to also emphasize is this is not really a time for talking, it's a time for action. Uh, international law cannot be a passive spectator. It can't be sedentary. It needs to move with alacrity to protect and to insist on accountability. Uh, the day after... I commenced the investigation on the 2nd of March. I deployed a team to the region. I've been myself to uh, Ukraine twice in these last period, to Lviv and to Kiev. Uh, I've been to Busha and to Borodienko. And my team of analysts and forensic uh, experts, uh, anthropologists uh, and lawyers have been to other areas as well. And at the same time as conducting their own uh, independent uh, outreach and uh, investigations, they've been also uh, working and building relationships with the Ukrainian authorities. Ukraine has an excellent prosecutor general. Uh, there's great work done at the regional level by Europol, uh, and particularly Eurojust. Um, we, we signed a joint investigation team uh, agreement the day before yesterday, in which for the first time in the history of uh, the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor is a participant in that joint investigation team with Poland, with Lithuania, and with Ukraine. And in parallel to that, there are more than nine uh, other European states that are conducting structural and other investigations. Uh, the truth does not need to be a phantom that cannot be grasped. It's grasped by, it's grasped by rolling up one's sleeves, by working, by conducting old-fashioned investigative efforts, by using modern technology, harnessing technology, whether it's satellite or radar or interception, and combining it to see what seems to be true. And ultimately, the great safeguard of international justice is not down uh, to a particular witness, it's not down to a particular prosecuting national authority, it's not down to me. There are judges above us, independent judges that will evaluate uh, and weigh the evidence and ultimately make determinations. So I think uh, uh, the message at the moment really must be a reinvigoration of the law, a acceleration of effort to make the law solid, 
to make the law real and uh, not an abstract principle uh, that is uh, for lawyers in their robes in courtrooms in the distant Hague or even in uh, courtrooms in Ukraine or in Poland or anywhere else for that matter. It really needs to be seen and it needs to be have an effect to try to mitigate the worst excesses of human behavior that are manifested in crimes within the court's jurisdiction. Uh, we should feel ashamed. We should feel ashamed that in 2022 we continue in so many parts of the world to see uh, violence that may constitute genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. And the pictures at this particular moment, the focus is on Ukraine, but in many other parts of the world, we need to do better. And we need to realize there is hope. Uh, there are examples out there, but we need to, all individuals, uh, the, the media, uh, the great journalism, in fact, that we've seen by different media houses, the great courage going into uh, different locations, uh, very uh, good NGOs, uh, national authorities. Nobody should be a bystander because if we don't stand up for justice now, uh, who will stand up for justice for any of us? Uh, Mr. Prosecutor, it's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Have you identified any command responsibility focuses? In other words, is Putin a subject of interest in, in, in any of the war crimes that you have seen so far? And how is the United States, even though they're not signatories of the Rome Statute, how are they contributing? They said they are sending information. Are they doing that to, the, to your office? Thank you. Yes. No, it's an interesting question and, and, and a good question, but we follow the evidence. We don't, uh, uh, we're not so self-indulgent or inappropriate to decide with the targets and then try to get evidence, scratch and grub around for evidence that fits pre-identified targets. That action would not be becoming of a, a local prosecutor in a local magistrate's court, and it's certainly not appropriate at the international level. We follow the evidence, uh, and we are, uh, nobody has uh, a free pass on any side, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's the Russian Federation, whether it's uh, formal forces or whether it's uh, irregular uh, forces. Uh, the law is clear. There are clear parameters. Nobody can say in 2022 with the Internet, with, uh, with the Twitter, with um, movies, with, uh, that nobody knows what these laws are. Everybody knows what these laws are. The question is, do people think that international criminal law is an a la carte menu, that you can take what you want and ignore what you don't? And I think uh, collectively all states are not perfect. None of us are. There's been a degree of duality. There's a, been a degree of selectivity. But I think now we're at a very acute moment in which we need to realize whatever the momentary discomfort of complying with the law at a state level, uh, it is far better and it is far less painful than the alternative, which is uh, a wild west of unpredictability that could lead to even more catastrophe on a global scale. James Bayes. Uh, on the U.S., I've said since before my election, I will reach out and engage with state parties and with non-state parties. You've seen today the excellent Ambassador at Large uh, uh, for uh, Global Criminal Justice. Ambassador Beth Van Schack has made her remarks, and I think they speak much more eloquently than I could possibly try to replicate. James Bayes from Al Jazeera. Um, you said in the meeting that you've made three attempts to try and contact Russia you also heard from the Russian representative in that meeting who said the ICC is merely a political instrument and has nothing in common with justice. Having heard, heard those words, what are your reaction to that and what will it mean for your investigation if you get no cooperation from Russia? You know, it's not uh, unknown in uh, local uh, prosecutions uh, that um, there may be non-cooperation from different individuals that one wishes to speak to. Uh, that doesn't mean that one retires uh, or that one uh, goes to bed and pulls the covers over one's face. It means that they, one looks at other approaches. Uh, I, I've said very clearly I don't have an agenda. Uh, I'm not in favor of Russia or against Russia, nor am I in favor of uh, Ukraine or against Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, an issue of politics. What we are in favor of, and it wasn't a soundbite, is that we are in favor of the law, which is in favor of humanity, which is to protect humanity. Um, and so we will do our job. Uh, there's always different ways to try to get to the truth. And as long as we have the stamina, uh, the strategic focus and the uh, plan in place, uh, there are always different uh, options to try to get to the truth. And we've seen it. It's not a hot air. You've, you've heard already today examples that you all know very well, whether it's uh, 
Sierra Leone and Charles Taylor, or whether it's uh, you know uh, ICTY cases from low level to the highest level, the basic principle is not new. It's based upon even uh, in antiquity, but in more recent times, or at least in 1215, the Magna Carta uh, and the uh, well-known adage that the, the king is under no man but God and the law, this applies with equal force today, that the law is above us. And if the law is not below, uh, above us, there's nothing below us uh, except the abyss. Michelle Nichols from Reuters. We've heard um, a lot of growing concerns here about sexual violence in Ukraine, um, even an accusation that rape may be used, may be being used as a weapon of war. Uh, what evidence has your office found so far of sexual violence in Ukraine? I, I'm not going to discuss the nature of evidence because we uh, hear reports. We'll take evidence, and every piece of evidence has to be evaluated. But I said uh, very early on, I think in my first uh, interview, in fact, um, and based upon experience, that uh, whilst we were focusing at that stage, uh, or even the newspaper reports and the TV reports were focusing uh, on shelling, on, on targeting, um, it was not surprising that um, as urban warfare intensified, uh, I said I feared that there would be increasing uh, allegations and reports of sexual gender-based uh, violence and also increasing reports regarding how cr children may be targeted or certainly affected uh, by, by conflict. And we need to, um, you know, continue our discipline and, and our focus. So the way we approach evidence and the detachment and the objectivity with which we collect it and consider it can be uh, capable of being, you know, assessed and, if necessary, uh, presented to judges without it being uh, polluted with any consideration that we've jumped the gun and we haven't followed normal processes. But it's a very important area. It's an, an area that I have said repeatedly even before the 24th of February, I will prioritize uh, sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children are uh, traditionally underreported, uh, under-investigated uh, and under, under-charged. And particularly, uh, even more so I think than anything else, children very often are invisible and we need to bring them into the, into the light in terms of how they are affected by, uh, by conflict and particularly by any allegations that may constitute statutes within the ju uh, crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. Uh, Mr. Khan. Mr. Khan. Sorry, this lady first, then you. But your voice is very loud. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Um, two questions. First... Um, how do you feel having been through this whole meeting about the issue of trying to get the, all of the disparate groups that are doing investigations together so that you're not duplicating efforts and uh, on trying to get some kind of uh, an arrangement for accountability rather than having 15 different efforts. And then I'll ask you my next, my second question. No, then I will give it to the other lady. Oh, okay. Yes, so a good try, though. So in relation to the, uh, and we can come back if, if there's time. Uh, in relation to the, the, the first question, I mean, I've said uh, uh, in different fora, um, you know, more does not need, mean better. I think there's clear um, distinction between the International Court of Justice, which is a principal organ, of course, of the United Nations, uh, has a, a well-known and a vital role for state responsibility, uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, of course, the ICC, and then, you know, the Rome Statute is built upon complementarity. So it's the obligation, not just the right, the obligation, the responsibility of states to step up uh, and go forward. Now, in addition to that, into the mix, there's many other initiatives uh, that are there, um, and I think coordination is vital. And what I've said in, in, in different fora that we have seen in terms of uh, humanitarian assistance and you know, uh, the need for OCHA, and I think in areas that are within the jurisdiction of the court, um, we should be willing to partner and work and also coordinate in a way that OCHA uh, endeavors to do for humanitarian assistance. I think we've had excellent uh, relationships so far with uh, the president, uh, Ladislav Hamran, of uh, Eurojust. We need to be non-territorial. It's not about building fiefdoms or uh, empires. It's about making sure that uh, every action is as effective as possible 
uh, because um, the world is watching, but also we have responsibilities in a very serious matter that we have to, you know, um, move forward with. So I think that's uh, how we will work, uh, hopefully, ever more effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, Margaret Bashir with Voice of America. Uh, you mentioned the collection and consideration of evidence. Could I ask you what role will technology play in your collection of evidence, and what sorts of things will you consider in terms of evidence, like from satellite photos to text messages to social media posts to this e-enemy chatbot? Uh, there's various things out there. What, what do you consider to, to reach the international standard, I suppose, for well, evidence. Yeah, I'll deal with the first part of that question first. Of my, I think it's a fabulous question. It's actually very close uh, to my heart. Even before my election and throughout, I've been uh, repeatedly saying that to deal with the mass data sets that are one of the distinguishing characteristics of um, uh, acts and indeed crimes that may come within the jurisdiction of the court, social media, uh, internet, photographs, um, video, uh, not just testimonial evidence, we need to harness technology ever better and uh, we did that quite effectively in my last mandate uh, as the special advisor and head of the UN team investigating ISIS. Um, we've had uh, some indications of support uh, for that and we're going to uh, improve um, the c capacity of the court and you know it's about partnerships. Uh, technology is not a substitute to uh, old-fashioned methods, but proper effective investigations cannot take place without proper technology. You know, there needs to be a way to in ingest this uh, variety of material, testimonial, video, audio, uh, forensics. Um, there needs to be ways to um, uh, map out the different types of evidence, to look at the uh, um, metadata, which is uh, vital. I mean, you can imagine a witness uh, very often uh, traumatized with the passage of time, their memories naturally uh, will may change, may falter, uh, and uh, judges, of course, must ultimately uh, assess uh, the credibility of a particular witness. The same applies to forensic evidence, but the advantage is if forensic evidence is collected properly, uh, the metadata um, can be um, scrubbed off uh, and collected in a way that doesn't alter, and then it's more capable uh, you know, to be uh, uh, viewed as reliable once it's been uh, tested and uh, it's been looked into. So it's absolutely, um, you know, essential. There was an area I think I didn't answer. What was that part? Oh, this uh, uh, this e-chatbot, e-enemy chatbot, would you include that in it, in it as well? I think all kinds of technology, and oh, I, I remember my point now, it's, it's not simply <laughs> doing it with states. Um, I've said that every, you know, nobody can be a spectator. And I must really uh, single out and commend Microsoft and its president uh, Brad Smith, because we uh, worked very closely with them in uh, in UNITAD, my, my last mandate, and on my first tri uh, trip to Ukraine, when I came back, they were at the airport at Shkipol. I had further meetings, and they've also pledged to partner with us so that cognitive services, you know, the machine learning tools, the artificial intelligence, the face identification, uh, the um, um, you know, translation tools that allow you to really identify what's, what should be looked at more closely, uh, all of that can be done far more effectively um, with technology. And then, of course, uh, the experts in the team can look into it, you know, dive into it more closely uh, and see what it shows. So I think this is, uh, you know, if, if any team does not embrace that fully, we're missing a massive opportunity. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, we're, we're going to have that ready very soon. Chris Reyes with CBC News. Uh, with an investigation this thorough and this complex, is, is there any kind of timetable that you could give um, in terms of how this will play out? Well, we need to move quickly. I mean, quite frankly, uh, international criminal justice can't... I mean, I can't afford um, to be pedestrian. You know, in the Georgia situation, let me be quite... You know, uh, it, it was an investigation that commenced because of events in 2008. And um, there was a preliminary examination, there was an investigation. I did an evidence review uh, in uh, November 2021. Uh, I applied for warrants in uh, March 2022. The judges will determine it. But we can't work in a way that by the time warrants are issued or that the prosecutor seeks a warrant, nobody remembers what happened originally. 
So I think the model also needs to change for international justice. I've said repeatedly this is an opportunity um, to redefine success. I said this before Ukraine. It's nothing specific to Ukraine. But, um, you know, we need to not view ourselves as a top of a pyramid, an apex, but really more of a hub in which we are a court of last resort. Uh, the judge is there to determine matters. But we can also feed in information, going back to technology, uh, to the spokes of national prosecutions. We can receive as well, collect as much information from states, but also our independent investigations, verify, look at the undercurrents, look whether evidence has been fabricated or altered, uh, and then feed it to national authorities because every state has certain international law responsibilities and certainly every state has national legal responsibilities so those that have uh, jurisdiction uh, need to uh, be supported so I think really that's the um, the model and the other one is I think the court uh, the, the previous model I've inherited a number of cases but I think um, you know generally we need to try over a period it won't happen straight away but we need to focus on maybe fewer cases over the next uh, period and go deeper instead of trying to do three or four cases uh, or five cases or six cases uh, from a situation uh, go deeper because then you have a, a, an impact and also the knowledge you've uh, gathered, the skills that have been um, you know, um, brought into a particular situation, language and politics and undercurrents and culture or, or military organization, they can be more effectively deployed uh, by going uh, more deeply. And then hopefully we can see that this idea of international justice isn't... Uh, some kind of kumbaya principle. It's not about campfires and feeling good or trying to, you know, uh, say a few words in the face of a gale that is silence, silencing our words before they get out of our mouths. We can show that international law can be effective, uh, effective and nimble and, and meaningful. And this is why I said earlier, it is one of these anchors that maybe we've disregarded. Before Ukraine, many countries have disregarded it. This is part of the contradictions and paradoxes of relationships. We have to stick with the law. Uh, this is one of the lessons, I think, as humanity and definitely as the United Nations, we need to heed. Stick to the law even when it causes discomfort, even when you feel you can get away with it or you can ignore it or close one's eyes to it. Because what we see is that if you don't hold yourselves to these principles, uh, others uh, with ever greater boldness um, tear up these principles, and I think this moment we see it coming together. Uh, the fact that uh, 42 countries uh, have uh, uh, referred the matter to the court does not sh show to me the impotence of international law. It, it shows a vivid realization that we need the law more than ever, and now the challenge is not to talk about it, but to implement it. Anybody else? Okay, just one last question, I promised to... Um, you yourself have been to Ukraine, you've been to Bucha and some other places. Um, what was your reaction when you saw, for instance, the destruction and devastation in Bucha, and are you planning to go back to Ukraine again? Yes, God willing, of course. It's, uh, I think uh, I've said repeatedly one can't be effective as a lawyer or as an investigator um, without knowing the country and learning about it. One can't be a legal commando. Uh, you need to actually spend time in the country, and this is what we're trying to do with the team. In, in terms of feelings, I, I won't uh, get into that, but I've been to many uh, parts of the world, in Asia, in uh, Northeast and West Africa, in Europe, in the Balkans, uh, in Rwanda, and, of course, in, in Ukraine and many other parts as well. And um, domestically, whenever one sees, whether it's domestic violence... Uh, whether it's rape or whether it's uh, on a massive scale, uh, of course, uh, one has to be objective, whether you're a forensic officer, a crime scene officer, uh, you know, somebody in an ambulance or a, a fire, a, a member of the uh, fire service uh, or an international lawyer. Um, but at the same time, one needs to remain detached and be forensic about matters to always have a, a critical thought in one's mind because that's how you build strong cases, uh, not by... Uh, simply accepting anything at face value. You need to get to the bottom of everything. And when we do that, uh, I have every confidence that independent judges also will do the same, and the people should, uh, you know, the truth will emerge. And I think we will go faster uh, than before, and this is one of the opportunities to see how fast can we go as we are building additional capacity at the same time. Thank you so much.
This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.